Uh, I'm Steve Call, I'm the uh, author of Private Empire, Exxon Mobil and American Power. I wear lots of other hats too, but <laughs> that's the main one at the moment. Well, change their culture um, and change the way they operate because they, the executive who was rising to power at that time, Lee Raymond, used the crisis to remake the company. And he wanted to do some of this anyway, but he used the, the sort of trauma atmosphere, um, then the merger with Mobile to really re-engineer, and that's the right verb. They essentially created a engineering-led, rule-bound corporation driven by operating manuals, incredibly rigid, incredibly uniform, disciplined, tight, effective. Um, and it wasn't just that they changed their procedures, which they did in every way, or wrote them all down in manuals so that everything you did at the workplace every day, you could consult a manual to determine exactly how you should do it. But that mentality, that approach, the, the force of discipline and accountability and uh, documentation that was required to create those changes, it also influenced their outlook on everything. Uh, I think if you explain, if you ask why do they have the communications and social responsibility strategies they have, it's because it flows from this engineering-led, uh, one-size-fits-all, uniform approach to oil and gas operations in all their aspects. The funniest document I found in the Deepwater Horizon uh, investigations was this spill response plan that all the super majors that were operating in the Gulf of Mexico had filed. And they all used the same consultant. They all filed the same plan. Of course, we will remediate this one. But Exxon had its own 40-page appendix that was unique to its filing that showed how to manage the media in the event of an accident. It had, it had all kinds of press release scripts out, you know, we deeply regret, uh, and then fill in the blank here. And it just showed, you know, so their idea of how to deal with communities in a crisis where oil may be spilling into fisheries and businesses may be upended and, and not only wildlife but conceivably people could be endangered. And their idea is that, okay, let's think that through in advance and write down every word we might speak in that setting. <laughs> that's, you know, that's how it changed the company. And your is engineering, too. I think that's true. I think that's true in the sense that this is a kind of bet the company every day kind of business. So if you're not really um, under meaningful regulatory pressure, if that's not your experience of the risks of managing risk, they, then you, it, you do internalize it. And if you didn't have that $20 billion uh, fine uh, hanging over your head, which you know is coming if you, you fail to self-regulate adequately and you, and you blow off. Uh, a Macondo kind of accident, then yeah, it, it's it's pretty good motivation. But as you say, that the, the you know the, if you're writing a novel, you want your protagonist to have a dilemma. Uh, so Exxon Mobil's dilemma is that they are this company that has tried to wring all human fallibility out of their daily operations, but their business model is driving them inexorably into risk. So they're being driven into political risk in the ways that we've discussed. They're also being driven into operating risk because they have to operate in more and more frontier environments. So they can say, oh, we know how to do it. But the truth is that a lot of these wells under, wells under that kind of pressure, uh, in those kinds of operating environments, in Arctic ice, in cold water, in harsh climates, in very deep water, in frontier geology, even fracking, which... Exxon, of course, talks about very confidently. The truth is that nobody knows what happens when you frack on this scale of industrial operation because it hasn't been done before. I mean, maybe it's harmless, but it hasn't been done before. And uh, so they're constantly out on risk frontiers while trying to wring all risk out of their operations.
Yeah, it's not. Uh, in the energy area, we are not organized uh, to actually govern ourselves in proportion to the risks that we are collectively under. That, that's my view. We're just not organized. I mean, there are other areas where we're reasonably well organized <laughs> to do that. I mean, the defense of our shores against attack. I mean, we've gotten ourselves over-organized, if anything, or about that. Uh, but it's, it's a funny thing because there are sections of the energy economy that are reasonably well supervised and organized. Uh, and electricity generation, for example, at the, you know, at the regional level, though it's been deregulated over the last 15 years and is probably more at risk than it used to be. You know, between the, um, the rise of the public utility commissions and the, rec and the, and the electrification of rural America, and the, and the long run in which it was recognized that electricity provision is so fundamental to quality of life, health, and the economy that it simply cannot be left to the kinds of haphazard, self-regulating market forces that we see in the oil industry. And so we, we developed a public interest standard, a whole system of, of regulated, mixed private public enterprise approaches to this with a universal service standard uh, as part of the compact. And the government systems that arose up out of that, you know, they're expensive, they're inefficient, they didn't always produce uh, what was, but they, but they basically built the infrastructure that allowed for this postmodern industrialization of the United States, reindustrialization of the United States through the computer industry, the information industry, telecommunications industry, until recently we kind of lost our grip. But for 50 years, it was a pretty good system. Now, oil is just a funny thing because it's, it is a utility. You go to the gas pump, you drive a car, you know, you can't get out of your your relationship with gasoline. We don't we don't approach it with public interest standard in mind. Um, change. Maybe. I, I mean it was I was on a panel last night with the former president of Shell USA and he we were having a conversation similar to this, and I, I said, I don't see where the change comes from unless it's a crisis uh, that's, that's really scale, you know, large scale. When we got 9-11, we got the Department of Homeland Security. Now, I'm not sure the Department of Homeland Security is better than what we had before. But there was a reorganization of federal authority, and it's certainly more powerful than it was before. And he was advocating for a single Federal Reserve-inspired regulatory agency that would consolidate the 13 cabinet offices that now regulate the oil and gas industry and the 25 different, you know, that there would be like a, a quad, a, an SEC, Federal Reserve inspired, uh, non-political, independent regulatory agency that would be, that would govern energy and environmental regulation around energy in one strong shop, in part to actually match the, the potential of the regulated corporations. Um, now, it, it's interesting that someone like him would conceive of such a uh, solution, but as you say, it's very hard to imagine where the politics for that come from unless there is a ginormous uh, crisis. Yeah, yeah. yeah and, and, and the oil industry is creating these behemoths because of the sheer scale of profitability that that utility function creates. I mean, ExxonMobil is the largest corporation on the Fortune 500 list. Two of the other top five are oil companies, Chevron and Conoco. I mean, who, who thinks about Conoco every day? Chevron is, I think, third or fourth. And ExxonMobil's revenues are twice as great as Chevron's. And that's just within the top five of the Fortune 500. So just putting your mind around the scale of these institutions takes some doing. And all of that flows into our regulatory system and our political system. And we had that shock in the banking and the Wall Street system, and we got Dodd-Frank and, and maybe some revival of Klaus Stiebel, and there'll still be a contest between regulators and, and the banks, but um, at least we're having the right conversation about too big to, to fail and systemic risk. In the oil industry, we're not. So the, the question is, again, what kind of a shock would would create, uh, you, would, you wouldn't necessarily want to live through that crisis, but um, I, I think it's likely over the next 20 years that there will be um, multiple catastrophic environmental accidents and some of them will be very vivid north of the Arctic Circle. We're going to have a big wreck up there and it's going to be ugly. 
and I don't know whether uh, you know that will galvanize the majorities in the lower 48. Fracking also, I don't think, is a is um, a story that's finished yet. It doesn't. Part of, of course, what you see in banking is that that you would also see in energy, and it was true in the Department of the Interior when you look at the specific regulatory regimes that surrounded Gulf deepwater drilling in the years leading up to the Deepwater Horizon accident, just read the National Commission report, is that federal civil service is just not up to overseeing the degree of complexity and wealth that it is charged to oversee. I mean, it just doesn't have the capacity to uh, keep up with the derivatives traders and the, and the speed algorithm writers on Wall Street, and it doesn't have the capacity to keep up with the degree of complex engineering and interdisciplinary project management that's going on on these offshore oil platforms. And if you if you did have the human capacity, industry would immediately hire it. <laughs> so. I think what's realistic, you know, if I were king, would be to identify those utility functions that are essential uh, to the national economy, to society, to uh, an equal, just, and accessible um, economy, and ring fence those, and force the corporations out of um, risk profiles in those areas, and then manage the risk profiles without any too big to fail institutions and without any catastrophic risk uh, on the periphery of those core utility functions. The problem, obviously, in Wall Street was that we mixed our deposit banking system with, you know, a bet the company global derivative speed algorithm writing financial system, and. There's no reason why we should do that. <laughs> if, if, if you want to, you know, if you want, if Citigroup is prepared to provide retail deposit banking and lending, commercial lending services, uh, without intermingling its viability as an institution with that side of the house, and it's back to cross steeple there. And there's there's an analogy in the oil industry, which is we should determine uh, what is the utility function in our energy economy ring fence that, regulate it carefully, and if we have to exclude environmentally risky activity in the continental United States, um, we should evaluate what the costs of excluding that are. But we shouldn't kid ourselves into thinking that we're going to be able to provide oversight on these frontier environments that's going to be meaningful to these companies. The only, either we accept the fact that they're self-regulating out of fear of failure because of the costs they would pay, the $20 billion fine, either we accept that as the risk equation we're going to undertake with some relatively light oversight. Or we ban the activity. We, and we do both right now. You know, we're not really sure. We both ban it and we lightly regulate it. <laughs>